Hello, my name is Brian Bush and I'm the park manager for the Perryville Battlefield State Historic Site. And the artifact we're gonna talk about today belonged to Brigadier General William Kilgore. And just to show you real quickly, this is a photograph of William Kilgore. Also, there's another photograph of William Kilgore. As you can tell, he was an extremely tall gentleman, way over six foot two. Also on the table here, we have his sword which is fairly unusual because it's actually a cavalry sword and he was actually an infantry commander. We also have some of his buttons that would have been on his uniform. You also can see in the middle have an eye indicating he was with infantry. And also we had of his shoulder boards with the rank of major and these were worn by him at the Battle of Perryville. You can see the background on it is blue, again indicating he's infantry. And then also we have his sword belt with hangers and his belt buckle for a Union officer. Now William Kilgore was born in Cumberland County, Pennsylvania on June 12th of 1828. He was the second child of Colonel Ezekiel and Elizabeth Kilgore. Ezekiel was Colonel of the 1st Regiment of Cavalry, which he raised in Cumberland County. He was a farmer and kept several teams of oxen and horses which he used to break prairie land for other farmers at $1.50 an acre. He also transported wheat to Chicago. He also carried mail from Sterling to Fulton and Albany. In 1837, his family moved to Sterling, Illinois. William's mother, Elizabeth, was born in 1801. They had seven children, Nancy, Jane, William, Isaiah, Ezekiel Jr., Martha, and Eliza. Ezekiel died on January 14th of 1848. William acquired a professional education and became a teacher while studying law. In 1856, he was admitted to the bar, and the following year, he was admitted to the bar of the Federal Circuit Court and District Courts, and eventually admitted to the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. He was also a prominent politician. Originally, he was a Whig, but when the Whig Party collapsed after the death of Senator Henry Clay, he joined the Republican Party and organized the Republican Party in Illinois and nominated for governor. When he was elected to the bar in 1856, he was Justice of the Peace and Supervisor for the Township of Sterling. He was also a large property owner in Sterling City and uh, owned land in the township. He also took an active interest in the business interests of the city. In 1861, when the Civil War broke out, he joined Company B of the 13th Illinois Volunteer Infantry and was elected second lieutenant. He participated in several minor engagements, such as Wet Glaze, Lynn Creek, Springfield, Missouri, and Salem. He also served as judge advocate. In 1862, he resigned due to ill health, and several months later, he had recovered from his illness and recruited Company I of the 75th Illinois Infantry. Now, also talking about his military career, at the organization of the 75th Illinois, he was promoted a major in order to take temporary command. On September 2nd, 1862, the regiment companies elected their officers. They elected Dr. George Ryon, R-Y-O-N, as Colonel. John Bennett becomes Lieutenant Colonel, and Kilgore was a major. On September 29th, the regiment marched out towards Jeffersonville, Indiana, and crossed into Louisville, Kentucky. The Army of the Ohio was reorganized, and the 75th Illinois was assigned to the 30th Brigade, 9th Division, 3rd Army Corps. On October 1st, the regiment marched out with the rest of the Army towards Perryville. And now let us go ahead and walk out to the battlefield, and I'll show you exactly where the 75th Illinois Infantry was located during the Battle of Perryville. So let's walk out to the battlefield, shall you? All right, we're now here at the battlefield, and I'm standing approximately where the 75th Illinois Infantry would have been located uh, during the battle in the late afternoon, almost evening. And nearing sunset on the day of battle on October 8th of 1862, Union General Lavelle Rousseau received a courier announcing that a brigade from the Federal Third Corps under Union General Robert Mitchell's 9th Division awaited orders for action. As the fresh brigade under Colonel Michael Gooding formed his line of battle, General Rousseau withdrew Colonel Leonard Harris's worn-out brigade. 
Colonel Gooding formed his line of battle. The 22nd Indiana took position on the right, the 59th Illinois on the left, and the 75th Illinois in the center, with Penny's 5th Wisconsin Battery on an eminence near the Danville, or excuse me, the Dixville Crossroads in Gooding's rear, which was bordered by some woods. He ordered his brigade to the support of Webster's brigade finding on his left, which had retreated and fallen back. His brigade was formed on the line of battle with the 75th Illinois Infantry relieving the 3rd Ohio Infantry on the left. The 22nd Indiana formed on the right of the 38th Indiana Infantry in an open field behind and slightly above the Russell House. And the 59th Illinois placed on the right of the 22nd Indiana Infantry. Now to give you an indication where I'm located, I'm on the Hayes May Road. And right behind me is where the location of the Russell House, which no longer exists. I'm gonna spin back around here. Instantly, the battle raged furiously. The roar of the cannon and musketry was deafening. Gooding wrote that, quote, one after one, my men were cut down. Here we fought alone and unsupported for two hours and 20 minutes against General Wood's division, unquote. Com composed of 15 regiments and a battery of 10 guns. And he quotes again, fiercer and fiercer grew the contest and more dreadful became the onslaught. Gooding wrote that, quote, hand to hand, they fought at least five times their own number, often charging upon them with such fearlessness and impetuosity as would force them to reel and give way. But as fast as they were cut down, their ranks were filled with fresh ones, unquote. At one time, the 22nd Indiana Infantry charged on the 32nd Mississippi and the 33rd Alabama with fixed bayonets, completely routing them from their position on the right of the brigade. William Preston, Company B, 33rd Alabama, wrote about the attack from the 22nd Indiana. He stated that, quote, the Federals got to advancing around the right of the 33rd Alabama, where it had no support and doubling its right back in the rear of its left. The regiment pivoting on the right of the 32nd Mississippi, near where Major Frank M. Gaylor, Chief Quartermaster for Wood's Brigade, was standing over a wounded officer when killed a little later. And Captain Robert E. Ward had been wounded and fell about 50 feet to the right and in line with Gaylor and some 30 yards in front of the Federal line. Colonel Sam Adams had been wounded in the foot and Lieutenant Colonel Robert F. Crittenden ordered the left of the regiment to drop back some, the right being then quite 45 degrees in rear of the right of the 32nd Mississippi, the pivot. And falling back, the entire regiment dropped back some, but Colonel Crittenden halted us where we squatted on our knees, loading and firing for a short time in the valley or depression to the right and in rear of the right company of the 32nd Mississippi, and facing almost at right angles compared to our former point and front, where the 32nd Mississippi gave way and all ran up the slope. Colonel Crittenden, Captain Bob Hughes, and other officers rallied our fleeing, me fleeing men behind a worm fence, a graveyard, and checked them. <clears throat> While the 22nd was attacking the 32nd Mississippi and the 33rd Alabama, a reserve force under Confederate General St. John Lydell's brigade appeared approaching Gooding's brigade on the left, in which the 59th and the 75th were engaged. Gooding ordered the 22nd Indiana to the aid of the 59th Illinois on the left. The 22nd Indiana Infantry quickly came to the aid of the 59th. Gooding's brigade was now formed in an east-west line near the bed of the Mackville Road, faced to the north and firing on Lydell's troops. Lydell confronted a dark line hardly more than 25 paces off on the crest of the elevation they were ascending. Immediately, without orders, a desolatory fire issued from his line. Colonel General Leonidas Polk then, thinking he was seeing a fatricide occurring, mistakenly rode into Colonel Keith line of the 22nd Indiana shouting, cease fire, those are your friends. Once Polk realized he was in the Union lines, he managed to bluff his way out 
of the encounter and made his way back to Lydell's line telling Lydell to make sure every musket was loaded and then to fire on the Union line. The trumpets sounded fire and a tremendous flash of musketry for the whole extent of the line for nearly a quarter of a mile in length followed after the fire. It continued for some 15 minutes. The ground before Lydell's line of battle was literally covered with the dead and dying. During the volley, Lieutenant Colonel Squire Keith of the 22nd Indiana Infantry was killed. A Major Kilgore of the 75th Illinois, who we've been talking about, was severely injured when a ball passed through his stomach and liver. During the devastation, devastating fire from the Arkansas troops, Colonel Gooding had his horse shot out from under him, and he was taken prisoner and taken from the field. His brigade was overwhelmed and were forced to withdraw from the field. His brigade was overwhelmed and were forced to withdraw completely. The brigade fell back under the cover of a hill and reformed. The officer in charge realized that they had no support within a mile and they decided to withdraw from the field and fall back onto their lines. Now we're gonna go ahead and continue our tour here and we're gonna to go to the dye house where General Kilgore, at that time Major Kilgore, was taken to. Now we're at our last stop here, and this is the dye house. After Kilgore was injured, one of his comrades tried to clean the wound by taking a silk handkerchief, soaking the handkerchief in whiskey, attaching the handkerchief to a ramrod, and completely running the ramrod with the silk handkerchief through the wound. Most of the doctors thought his injury was fatal. After his injury, his men took Kilgore to a small log cabin nearby. Kilgore dictated his last message home to his mother to the regimental chaplain, William H. Smith. He was taken, later taken to the dye house, which you see here, which had been converted into a Union field hospital. After the Battle of Perryville, Kilgore remained under the care of a Union surgeon at the dye house until January of 1863 when he was taken to Louisville, Kentucky. Eventually, his sister brought him home to recover on sick leave. In 1870, after the war, Major Kilgore sent J.M. Dye an autographed copy of the book A Waif of, war, of the War, written by William Summer Dodge, who was also in the 75th Illinois Infantry, as an appreciation for the Dye's kindness to him and his men. William Kilgore's brother, Ezekiel Jr., had enlisted in Company I, 75th Illinois Infantry, was elected first lieutenant and participated in the Battle of Perryville along with his brother. But in December of 1862, his brother died from pneumonia in a military hospital in Nashville, Tennessee. In August of 1863, Kilgore recovered from his injury and rejoined his regiment in Stevenson, Alabama. On September 19th and 20th, he distinguished himself in battle at the Battle of Chickamauga, during the battle, on September 20th, he was taken prisoner, but managed to fight his way out with Company D, commanded by Captain Moore, through Confederate lines and rejoined his regiment. During the defense of Chattanooga, he was cut off from all communication and surrounded by the rebels. During the Battle of Lookout Mountain on November 24th, 1863, he was ordered to charge the Confederate works, drive the rebels up the mountain, and then push them off the mountain, which he did with honor. He participated in the engagements of Missionary Ridge and Ringgold Gap. After the Chattanooga Ringgold Campaign, he was detailed to recover the Chickamauga Battlefield and bury the Union dead. On December 5, 1863, he and his men performed the gruesome task of burying the Union dead who had remained in the field unburied and had been par partially destroyed by dogs, hogs, buzzards, and vultures. The burial detail took two days. In February of 1864, he returned to the brigade and fought in the Battle of Buzzard's Roost near Dalton, commanding the 80th Illinois Infantry. In May of 1864, he fought in the battles of Tunnel Hill, Rocky Face Ridge, and Dalton. He fought at the Battle of Resaca, Kingston, Cassville, Cartersville, Pumpkin Vine Creek, Pine Mountain, and Kennesaw Mountain. On July 4th, 1864, he commanded the skirmish line in Atlanta, Georgia. He also commanded a detachment of pioneers in order during the night to make an advancement movement and destroy the railway track of the Macon Railroad now near Altoona. On August 30th, he was at Jonesboro, Tennessee. On September 2nd, 1864, he fought at the Battle of Lovejoy Station. 
He fought at the Battle of Lost Mountain, where he pursued Confederate General John Pale Hood's army to Gay Galesville, Alabama. He commanded a detail compromising the 75th Illinois and the 23rd Ohio to guard 700 government teams with army supplies through Confederate territory. He participated in the Battle of Athens, Dalton, Pulaski, Spring Hill, Franklin, and Nashville. During the Battle of Nashville, on the first and second day of battle, he charged the Confederate first and second line of earthworks and captured them. He was wounded three times during his career. For his services at Missionary Ridge, he was breveted colonel. At Atlanta, he was breveted brigadier general. During the Civil War, he participated in over 27 engagements. On July 29, 1866, he was appointed a captain in the regular states, regular, excuse me, the United States Regular Army and was Brevetan Major, Lieutenant Colonel, and Colonel in the Regular Army for meritorious services while he had volunteered in the Army. He was discharged from the Army with officially holding the rank of Captain. After the war, he resumed his practice as a lawyer in Sterling, Illinois. On November 30th, 1865, he married Isabella Junkin near Iowa City, Iowa. They had two children, Eliza Graham and Susan Junkin, James Albee, Cassius Mathers, and Freddie, who died in infancy. He was a member of the International Order of Odd Fellows, the, King, the Knights of Pythias, and the Grand Army of the Republic. He died on May 20th, 1885, at the age of 56 in San Jose, California, and is buried at the Oak Hill Cemetery in San Jose. And again, thank you for coming on my journey to the battlefield today and learning about General William Kilgore. And again, come on out to the Perryville Battlefield State Historic Site and walk our 19 miles worth of interpretive trails and come visit our museum. Again, I'm Brian Bush, park manager, and thank you for coming on my journey today.